Good evening. My name is Annette Estrada. I'm one of the board members of the World Affairs Council. And on behalf of the board and all of us, welcome. We're glad you could join us here in spite of the best challenges that West Michigan has to offer. If you're not a member already of the World Affairs Council, we hope that you will consider to become a member. Not only will you get special event pricing for all of our events, but you'll also be able to be part of this dialogue, very well-informed, globally-oriented dialogue that the World Affairs Council has to offer. The Great Decision Series is a nationwide program, and all the councils around the country have the same programming that we have here in West Michigan. And tonight, as with the, all the other... Listen to the mic, we're having trouble hearing. As with all the programs that we've had in the Great Decision Series, uh, you will have an opportunity to voice your opinion about the program we have today by filling out the ballot. This was a new program, and we hope that you will complete the ballot and turn it in on your way out after the event tonight. There also is a Great Decision Study Guide for more detailed information about today's program and the other programs in the series. And this is also available at our check-in desk outside for a mere $20. It has a great bibliography if you care to delve into any of the topics in a little bit more detail. I also want to thank our media sponsor, Michigan Radio. And my firm, Medio, is the evening sponsor for the event today. And as head of the German desk for Medio, I'm very interested to hear what our speaker, Dr. Higa, has to say today. Before I introduce him, one more housekeeping detail. After the formal remarks uh, from Dr. Higa tonight, you will have an opportunity, as always, to ask questions. And if you want to do so, please raise your hand, and one of our volunteers will bring a mic to you so that we can all have an opportunity to hear your question. So without any further ado, it's my pleasure tonight to introduce Dr. Günther Higa. In his personal biography, he said he was born in Schwaben, in Swabia, that he was born on All Saints Day, and that he was born in the year the Berlin Wall was built. And he attributes this constellation to the fact that he's always had a very deep interest in politics, and uh, that he's, he has a very idealistic worldview, I guess that has to do with the All Saints. Yeah? <laughs> After completing his high school in Germany and uh, getting the coveted Abitur, which is the high school diploma from a German high school, he was drafted into the German military. And after he did his military service, he went to the University of Tübingen, uh, where he studied. Uh, and while he was there, he agreed to, or was asked to do a one-year exchange program to Washington University in St. Louis, Missouri. When he was there, he applied to the PhD program at Washington University, for which he was accepted and ultimately earned his PhD from that university. However, in 1989, he went back to Germany to observe firsthand the events that ultimately led to the tearing down of the wall that was built in the year in which he was born. And many of you in this room here remember those events. He's been at Western Michigan University since 1994 where Dr. Heger teaches international relations, European politics, comparative politics, comparative public policy, and several other subjects. In 2004, the Western Michigan University College of Arts and Sciences faculty received the Faculty Achievement Award in teaching. And also in 2004, he was honored by the American Political Science Association and Phi Sigma Alpha, the National Political Science Honor Society for Outstanding Teaching. He advises students and is the faculty rec director of Western Study Abroad, Abroad Program in Germany. In his copious free time after doing all of those things, Dr. Heger also publishes books, writes books and articles, presents at conferences, he does media interviews, he does presentations on German and European politics, comparative education policies, federalism, and welfare state development in Europe and America. We are truly honored to welcome you here tonight and look forward to your comments under the title Germany Rising. Thank you very much. Thank you. 
Well, thank you very much for. Oh, we better switch this off, I assume. Okay. Can you still hear me? Yes? Okay. Um, thank you very much for having me. Thank you for a very nice introduction, Mrs. Estrada. Uh, I'm very glad to be here. Uh, I, I, I regret that it's under such uh, circumstances. I realize that most of you uh, probably came here expecting uh, Dr. Jackson Janes uh, tonight. Uh, unfortunately, he didn't make it in. Uh, I'll try to fill in for him as best as I can. Uh, I, I do want to encourage you. Uh, Jack is a, an old friend and he is a, he's a treasure when it comes to the study of German politics. So hopefully uh, Dixie can bring him back at some point and you get to enjoy his talk. Uh, and uh, well, maybe, maybe tonight I'll just do a little bit of a warm up act for him uh, when he comes back and uh, uh, does. Uh, his talk. My talk uh, tonight is uh, entitled Germany Rising, just like his, by chance. Uh, uh, and uh, the way I will structure my talk, do I have to point it at that thing? Oops, this is okay, a little bit. Uh, the way I, I, I structure my talk, I'm going to follow the outline of that cartoon that you see up there, a cartoon from the Economist, uh, version of the Economist, and it shows the German eagle, of course, with the face of uh, the current German Chancellor, Angela Merkel. Uh, uh, clearly, the, the German eagle is soaring. But as you can see, hopefully, it uh, has a big ball and chain uh, on his uh, uh, right leg. Uh, the euro uh, is holding uh, Chancellor Merkel back a little bit at the moment. And uh, that little thing flying, in addition to the, the arrows and stones, that are trying to take her down. The little box flying there is a, a, a ballot box. Uh, it points to the fact that uh, Dr. Merkel is uh, uh, facing uh, some important elections, uh, actually starting yesterday. Uh, the first uh, of seven state elections took place yesterday. And both the, the euro, the financial crisis, and the elections uh, in, the, in the, the states of Hamburg and others this year will have a significant effect on uh, uh, her performance as a chancellor, uh, her policies, and I'd like to talk about uh, both of these, these aspects. I start out with a couple of uh, background facts, and then uh, I'd like to talk about the economic picture, especially the euro crisis and the role that Germany plays in that crisis, and then I will move on and uh, talk a little bit about the political uh, factors that are relevant at the moment in Germany, the political outlook, and finally in the conclusion then I like to address uh, some of the questions that you no doubt will have. How does that impact Germany? How does that impact uh, the, uh, 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 the relations between the Federal Republic of Germany and the United States? This is unfortunately set uh, on automatic advance to uh, speed myself up a little bit, but uh, uh, it, gets a, it gets a little bit ahead of me at times, so please indulge me. Uh, there are a couple of technical difficulties still that I didn't have time to fix uh, given the, uh, the circumstances. Uh, this is another cartoon, and it, uh, it shows that uh, Germany, Chancellor Merkel, her government is riding uh, pretty high at the moment. Uh, she is riding out the crisis. The crisis has already, uh, this is from a German newspaper, uh, the Süddeutsche, the crisis has already uh, devoured uh, some of the, the others around here, but the German ship of state is still afloat, and uh, Angela Merkel and her government uh, have weathered the crisis so far uh, pretty well. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, the cartoon the, um, says there, uh, you, you need to uh, steer a little bit more uh, decisively, so there is some domestic criticism uh, on her steerage of the ship of state. Here are some statistics that will show you that Germany is doing well at the moment. Uh, on the upper left corner, uh, the GDP per person, Germany uh, has experienced the most growth in the last 10 years of any of the large world economies, the G7. Uh, you can see Germany has had uh, an annual GDP growth rate in the last decade from, of almost 1%, uh, 
which puts it ahead of uh, Britain, Japan, even the United States. Uh, the unemployment rate right now is lower than it has been in the last uh, 20 years in Germany. Uh, and once again, um, uh, historical lows uh, compared to uh, some of the, the neighboring countries. Uh, the budget deficit, also uh, 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 a favorable statistic, as you can see, sorry, uh, a favorable statistic, Germany, the Germans are frugal, they have not been spending uh, money as, as frivolously as uh, some of uh, their European neighbors. Uh, budget deficit is under control in Germany, uh, and so is household debt. Uh, Germans own, uh, owe less than uh, uh, most of the, the, the neighboring uh, uh, European uh, populations. The Economist uh, called Germany the most successful rich economy of the past decade. Now that is very different from uh, what the picture looked uh, 10 years ago. Uh, the Economist uh, has been very critical or was very critical uh, of Germany's performance until about you know, six, seven years ago. I remember a conference, uh, Jack Janes was there as well, um, in which uh, the annual conference of the German Studies Association, um, which I regularly attend of course, and at this conference one of the past presidents of the German Studies Association, a very distinguished historian, summed up the situation by saying, Germany right now is like the Titanic. Uh, uh, the, the, the ship is sinking, this was in 2001, and they are rearranging the chairs on, on the deck of the Titanic. That was his assessment of Germany 10 years ago. So we have to ask ourselves what happened? How did Germany go from the sick man of Europe 10 years ago to becoming the poster boy of, uh, uh, of, of the, the European Union at the moment? And uh, uh, some people even speak of a second economic miracle, uh, as you probably know, after World War II, uh, Germany uh, is said to have experienced uh, an economic miracle. The recovery from World War uh, II uh, was rather quick and uh, uh, rather successful. Uh, and right now, as I said, I already talked about the unemployment rate. It's the lowest since German unification, reunification in 1990. It's down to 7.2%. Uh, exports are surging. Uh, up to 18.5%, uh, you can read the, the numbers yourself. Uh, the trade surplus is up, um, the largest annual rise since 1990. Uh, and uh, uh, you have to know that about 60% of German exports go to other European Union member countries, uh, but also uh, one of the, the favorable statistics right now, exports to the United States, I'm sorry, to China have been rising. Uh, so after experiencing the worst recession uh, since uh, World War II in 2008, 2009, where the German GDP, the gross domestic product, uh, contracted by almost 5%, sorry, uh, now uh, Germany is back uh, after uh, a decline of 4.7% uh, last year, uh, Germany's economy grew by 3.6%. The best result, once again, in 20 years. The 2011 forecast is not quite as favorable, but uh, it's still good, 2.3%, uh, and uh, that puts Germany ahead of uh, most of its neighbors. All right, uh, what I want to uh, emphasize here is that uh, a good a part of that export growth that Germany has been experiencing uh, comes uh, through uh, a growth uh, in in exports to particularly countries like China, uh, but also uh, India. Um, you can read the numbers yourself. Uh, uh, Germany, uh, Germany's exports to China in the last 10 years grew by almost uh, 600%. They are now up to uh, 51 billion, almost as much as Germany uh, exports to the United States, uh, 69 billion um, uh, US dollars. Uh, annually, uh, those are the figures for 2009. No? Uh, this export surge, uh, the economic uh, statistics are reflected in uh, uh, the good mood that especially German businesses, German entrepreneurs, German corporations, I'm sorry, uh, are finding themselves in. 
Uh, the uh, uh, EFO uh, business index is, uh, you can see how, how it has uh, sort of uh, uh, ventured up and down. Uh, the deep crisis of 2008, 2009, but it's now up to record levels uh, as high as it was right after German unification uh, in 1990. Uh, so Germany has come out of this latest crisis uh, looking uh, rather strong. What are, the what are the contributing factors uh, for Germany's economic rebound? Um, why was Germany the Titanic 10 years ago? Why does it look so good now? Uh, some people would point to the fact that in the last 10 years, real wages in Germany have hardly risen, if at all. It depends on the, uh, the, the industrial uh, sector that we are talking about. Years of wage restraint, some retrenchment of the generous German uh, welfare state, uh, some retrenchment of the social benefits that uh, uh, provided uh, an incentive for especially the long-term unemployed to uh, uh, go out there and try to find work with the help of the government. Uh, this came under the label Agenda 2010. It was introduced in 2001, 2002. Uh, it's bearing some fruit now. Uh, the the HATS reforms, there were four of them, named after the former labor uh, relations director of uh, the Volkswagen concern who was put in charge of these reforms. Uh, Mr. Hartz uh, came up with the reforms of the, 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 the labor market, a deregulation of the labor market uh, that made it easier for employers to hire and to fire. Uh, flexible work time accounts were introduced, which is actually, I should uh, tell you a little bit more about that because that has proven to be one of the most successful ways of uh, uh, mastering the crisis. All right, I gotta get out of the light here. Uh, flexible work time accounts means that during economic boom times, uh, German workers in large corporations like Volkswagen work overtime without being paid overtime. Rather what they do is they bank those overtime hours uh, and during an economic recession, during a slowdown, uh, they can then uh, take those hours that they have worked over time uh, and uh, take off, take more vacation days, which uh, 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 with the same salary, with the same wage. Uh, so you can bank hours during uh, boom times when there is demand, when production is ramped up, and you can then uh, uh, live off those overtime hours with the same salary, no cuts uh, during uh, economic recessions. Uh, and that has worked both well for employers and it works of course for the workers because fewer people are laid off. Uh, this was introduced by uh, Volkswagen in the uh, late 1990s and it became a model for the rest of the German economy and it has helped Germany to weather the crisis uh, without rising unemployment, uh, without uh, as significant uh, 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 an impact uh, on, on uh, uh, tax revenues, on uh, uh, social security benefits than otherwise would have been the case. So a very successful model. You are also familiar probably with one other aspect of how Germany weathered the crisis. You remember the clash for Klunkers program? I'm sure that was a, originally a German invention, very successful, uh, that was then uh, copied by the Obama administration. Uh, that also helped the German automobile industry, of course, to, to weather the crisis. All these programs uh, have uh, sort of acted as automatic stabilizers of the German economy. Uh, uh, they, they have helped uh, to, to the German economy to bounce back rather quickly. Uh, German companies, by uh, not having to you know, fire and then rehire workers, have been able to pick up enhanced demand very quickly and they have uh, uh, jumped into uh, that opportunity and uh, that explains to some degree why the German economy, sorry, why the German economy uh, is, is uh, doing so well right now. All right, uh, anytime you have questions, feel free to uh, interrupt me if I need to explain something that's up there, uh, I'd be happy to do so. Uh, one other factor that I would like to point out why Germany's economy especially has been rising Small and medium-sized enterprises are doing particularly well, a very vibrant sector of the German economy. Uh, they are export-oriented, they have a global focus. Uh, 
even some of you know what you would call sort of mom and pop uh, uh, private uh, family owned businesses have a real global perspective uh, and that of course has contributed to the export boom they also are proud of their quality engineering of their uh, work uh, their quality work which sells well especially in countries like China and uh, India uh, what the Germans do is they produce uh, uh, the, the, the machine tools, they uh, produce the, the high quality uh, machinery that countries like China and India need, that China and India need for their own uh, economic expansion. Uh, I'll give you one example. Germany used to be the largest producer of solar power panels uh, 15 years ago. Uh, it was, uh, Germany jumped into green technology early. German uh, exporters or German companies uh, produced a lot of solar power panels, but then the, the Chinese, the Indians moved in with their cheap labor, uh, and now very, very little of the where are we? very little of the uh, of the solar power panels are anymore uh, produced in Germany. Uh, they are now produced in China and India, but Germany still produces power panels or produces the machinery that produces the solar power panels in China in India now. So instead of uh, uh, exporting the, the, the end pro product, the Germans now uh, export the machinery to produce the end product. Uh, and that's sort of a, a, a somewhat uh, uh, a typical fashion. Let me catch up with myself here, I'm sorry. Uh, so concentration on investment goods needed by other countries, especially uh, the emerging economies, um, to manufacture their end products. What has also helped, the last issue here on the, uh, on the the slide is, of course, the, the euro has weakened somewhat from its uh, 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 highest level uh, in 2007-2008. In, uh, uh, the euro, the single currency, rose to about $1.50 uh, per euro. It's now down to $1.35, uh, one euro being worth $1.35 uh, $1 right now, which, of course, helps German exporters, but it also makes... Uh, German imports, raw materials, somewhat more expensive. Um, so it, it, it works both sides. All right, uh, a couple more statistics. I don't want to uh, bore you too much with these, but uh, hopefully they will help make the point. Um, 20 years ago, the situation in East Germany uh, looked uh, very, very uh, uh, discouraging. Uh, Germany has now finished almost the task of modernizing the East German economy. Uh, 2.3 trillion US dollars over the last 20 years flowed into East, East Germany, the dilapidated uh, communist economy after 40 years of mismanagement has been thoroughly modernized. Uh, many of the, you know, the Leuchttürme, as the Germans would call them, the, the economic uh, 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 beacons are now located in East Germany, in Jena, in Dresden. You have very modern factories built over the last 10, 15 years uh, that, uh, that now are you know, paying substantial dividends. Um, East Germany is no longer the basket case that it was right after unification in 1990, so that also uh, is, is paying off. All right, this is a table I'm sure you won't be really able to to read the numbers very well, but uh, uh, what this does is, um, if anybody challenges me on any of my numbers, I, I can call up this table. But it shows you Germany, the second from uh, the second, uh, uh, well, the fifth row from top. Uh, it tells you uh, that uh, uh, Germany produces almost one fifth, 19.8 percent of the total European economy. Uh, Germany has about. Uh, 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 less than a quarter of the population, 83 million out of a total of 500 million people in the European Union, but Germany produces 20% uh, uh, of the, the total European output. Uh, the other uh, figures, uh, you know, in terms of public debt, uh, Germany is slightly below uh, the, the European average. The deficit looks good. As I said earlier, inflation looks good. Uh, we might, might have to go back and look at some of the other countries uh, to uh, 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 make some comparison. Uh, 
But uh, uh, as I said, there are some challenges ahead for Chancellor Merkel and her government. Uh, the, 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 at the national level, uh, regional level, and at the international level, I want to point out uh, two, in particular, of course, the ongoing Eurozone sovereign debt crisis uh, is uh, certainly one of the major headaches for not just Germany, but the, the rest of the European Union and the Eurozone, those 17 countries that have now adopted the Euro as their currency. Um, uh, for uh, Chancellor Merkel in particular, uh, the state elections uh, will be a major challenge. Uh, why? Uh, state elections in Germany are sometimes seen as sort of testing grounds. Uh, they measure the national mood in the country. Uh, and uh, oops, uh, uh, you might have heard that last night, yesterday, in the city-state of Hamburg, Chancellor Merkel and her coalition partner uh, the Free Democratic Party, her Christian Democrats and the Free Democrats did not do so well in the state elections uh, in Hamburg uh, yesterday and that might prompt uh, a change of uh, direction. Uh, we'll have to see. Uh, but there are going to be six more elections in Germany in the next couple of months this year. Uh, and uh, uh, each one of them uh, is going to be seen as a test of Merkel's leadership Despite the fact that there are regional elections uh, in Germany, uh, you know, you have elections going almost at any point in time. Every few months there is a, an important uh, state that holds elections. The last German government, uh, Angela Merkel's predecessors, essentially lost his job after his party lost an important state election and he felt that that indicated that the German people as a whole no longer supported him. So Chancellor Schröder, former Chancellor Schröder, called new elections at the national level. He lost those, didn't win them, and that led then to Angela Merkel's um, uh, ascendancy to the chancellorship in 2005. So state elections are important because they measure uh, 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 where the country stands, and uh, national politicians pay very, very close attention. Uh, there will be national elections, general elections in 2013, so a few years from now. Uh, but of course, uh, Dr. Merkel, Chancellor Merkel, is already uh, keeping an eye on uh, uh, her re-election chances and will try to assess those as well. All right, the European picture, the economic picture in Europe, another cartoon. Uh, you see uh, on the left, uh, um, President Sarkozy of France is trying to hold up the Greek pillar. Uh, Angela Merkel is ready to capture the falling euro. And the guy strolling in the back, of course, that's uh, David Cameron, the new Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, because uh, Britain did not adopt the euro, has not been part of the eurozone. Uh, he kind of has a, a, a more leisurely time. Uh, he's watching what's happening uh, uh, between his neighbors to the south. Uh, Angela Merkel and uh, Nicolas Sarkozy uh, have committed themselves to rescuing the euro. The most important part of that rescue package is a 17, 1750 uh, euro, billion euro bailout package. Uh, it, con it consists of the Euro European Financial Stability Facility. I'll explain what that is in a minute. Uh, here it is. Uh, of the countries that are contributing to the euro rescue, Germany is the major contributor, as you can tell. Uh, Germany. Uh, is, uh, has promised to contribute up to 27% of the total amount of money for this European financial uh, stability facility. So Germany is carrying more than its uh, share, if you will, uh, in terms of, of uh, uh, contributing to the rescue of the, the euro. Uh, what's perhaps most interesting here is the, the standard and poor credit rating of all the countries in this euro zone right now. Uh, you can see that those countries with the top rating, among them Germany, are going to carry almost 60% of bailing out uh, uh, the weaker countries uh, like Greece at the very bottom with a, a, a double B rating. Uh, other countries like Slovakia and Portugal uh, also have been rated down. Uh, it, it gives you an idea uh, who's, on whose shoulders uh, the, 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 the euro rescue package will will have to rest. Uh, uh, the total package is uh, 440 
uh, billion uh, euro right now, plus there is some commitment from the International Monetary Fund from the European Central Bank. The total back package will probably reach about one trillion uh, US dollars. All right, uh, this is what uh, Nicolas Sarkozy and Angela Merkel recently had to say uh, about how important the euro is to them. Uh, uh, Sarkozy, we will never let the euro fail. Uh, the euro is Europe. Uh, he said that at, uh, uh, at uh, the recent uh, World Economic Forum summit in Davos. Uh, and a few weeks earlier, actually, Angela Merkel at her New Year speech that she gives every year said something very similar. Uh, the euro is far more than a currency. Uh, you know, it's a guarantor uh, for Europe, and Europe is a guarantor for our peace and freedom. Uh, so both of them are committed to rescuing the euro. Uh, we will see uh, uh, how severely they will be tested, but they are both on the record that they will do anything uh, they need to do to save the euro. All right. Um, let me uh, point out a, f a few more uh, important uh, details about the uh, uh, economic and political picture here. Uh, Germany uh, was overtaken by China uh, as late as as recent as 2010 as the major exporter in the world. Uh, uh, Germany with a population of 83 million people uh, in 2010 was overtaken by the 1.3 uh, billion Chinese as the largest export nation in the world, uh, which tells you that the Germans have been doing pretty well. Uh, on a per capita, per person basis, they are still the world export champion. Uh, Germany, because of its economic strength, uh, is still and will remain the paymaster of the European Union. That is not necessarily uh, something that German taxpayers favor. Uh, and in response to that, uh, Angela Merkel and Nicolas Sarkozy jointly came out at the last European Union summit and proposed uh, what they called a European Competitiveness Pact. Essentially, they, will, they are trying to sequester, they are trying to uh, 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 force, I guess, uh, the rest of the European Union uh, to, to agreeing to a, an economic government for the Eurozone. Uh, and that would include the harmonization of pension rules across Europe, uh, a similar retirement age. Uh, it, uh, it would require some harmonization of uh, corporate tax rates, especially. Some countries are rather uh, uh, upset about that, Ireland being one of them. Ireland has uh, some of the lowest corporate tax rates in, in Europe. Uh, the Germans also proposed that uh, other European countries introduce what they have put in, into their constitution not too long ago, uh, a, a deficit break, they call it, uh, which essentially uh, requires the national government and the state governments to, to balance their budgets as a constitutional requirement. They like to see that um, uh, uh, as, a, um, you know, as, a, as a general European Eurozone rule. We'll see whether that will come about. Uh, and a couple of other measures that, in general, are set to make uh, the, the European, uh, uh, weaker European uh, countries, economically speaking, uh, make them more competitive, um, in, in, in many ways make them more German, uh, to, be, to be honest. So this is what the new European packing order looks like. Uh, another another uh, uh, cartoon from The Economist. Germany sits pretty up there on the top. Uh, France and the United Kingdom, the other two of the big three, uh, are also doing pretty well. Um, uh, it's uh, you know, the, the large number of countries in the middle, uh, medium-sized countries, uh, and then at the bottom, the so-called PICS, which is not a very nice uh, uh, acronym for uh, Portugal, uh, Italy, uh, Ireland, I'm sorry, Portugal, uh, Portugal, Ireland, Greece, and Spain, the so-called four PICS country. Uh, those are the ones that are in most economic trouble that will, Ireland and Greece already have drawn on that rescue fund that I mentioned earlier. Uh, Portugal and uh, Spain might be next, uh, and that is gonna cause uh, some, some further turmoil in the Eurozone, and certainly it will call uh, Germany uh, uh, 
it will call on Germany to perhaps even contribute more than they already have promised to this European uh, bailout fund. All right, the political obstacles that uh, Chancellor Merkel is facing, uh, by losing state elections, uh, the, the coalition uh, has already, the governing coalition in Germany has already lost control of one of the two chambers of parliament, the, 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 the Bundesrat, the chamber that represents the state governments. Um, after a defeat in May 2010, now you have a defeat in the state of Hamburg, so uh, the situation is not getting better. Uh, and this, the implication of co course is that German voters are telling uh, Angela Merkel and her coalition partner Guido Westerwelle uh, that uh, they do not like the role of being the paymaster of Europe. Um, they, they, they are indicating their un unhappiness with that fact. Uh, and one of the reasons why Merkel pushed for this competitiveness pact, she's trying to, you know, it's a balancing act for her. She's telling her voters at home in Germany, we are trying to improve, you know, the poor performance of our neighbor that we are supposed to bail out, so there will be no future bailouts. She's, she's trying to appease her voters at home. At the same time, of course, she is trying to be a good European, to continue to make, play a constructive role in Europe, uh, but you know, it comes with conditions attached nowadays. Um, I, I, let, me, let me interject here very briefly. Uh, I was at, uh, uh, at a conference in Brussels last May. This was right after the Greek crisis had sort of broken. And uh, at the time, there was a, an annual conference of the so-called uh, Jean Monnet professors, people who get money from the European Union for their research and their teaching. Uh, and they call us to Brussels every year uh, to exchange ideas, to you know, sort of account how the European money spends, how the European Union spends money on research worldwide. So we convened in Brussels in the, in the European Parliament building there. And uh, at the time, in, in May 2010, uh, there were two groups of people that really, really, uh, uh, the Europeans, uh, did not like, we are very critical about, uh, number one, American speculators that we are trying to bring down the euro, uh, betting against the euro, undermining the value of the euro. American sort of uh, investors and speculators uh, were, uh, uh, were uh, you know, persona non grata, and the German government, the German people, because the German taxpayer, because in, in, in comparison to previous smaller crises, the Germans were dragging their feet. They were not as willing to, uh, uh, you know, take care of the bill this time, uh, and uh, they were criticized for that very fact. Huh? So as a German-American, I was sitting very pretty, uh, representing both groups, in a sense, Americans and uh, Germans at this conference in Brussels. But the mood was really, it was, it was quite different from previous conferences. People were mad at the Germans for really uh, not, not uh, uh, being good Europeans like they had been in the past and um, you know, flashing their pocketbook quite as easily, uh, quickly as they had in the past. All right, uh, some of the political uh, factors that uh, are impinging on uh, Chancellor Merkel right now. Her coalition partner, the Free Democrats, which won 15% of the votes in the last election, the national election, are now down to roughly 5% in Hamburg. I think they just made it above the 5% threshold that uh, gives them some seats in the state legislature. So uh, they have lost two, well, uh, 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 more than half, uh, 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 I, to, to be safe, they have lost half of their voters at least in, in some regions of Germany, even more. Uh, so they are down now to six, seven percent, uh, 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 have fallen uh, in some regions below five percent. And that's a real threat to Angela Merkel because she needs the Free Democrats to govern. It's a coalition government. Uh, Merkel's party won about 30 uh, uh, was it 34, 35 percent in the le last election? So they needed those additional 15 percent uh, of the seats in the parliament to be able to govern the country effectively. That's a real threat. Uh, and the good economic performance of Germany has not translated into votes for the coalition government. Uh, the good economic performance has not bolstered uh, Merkel's uh, uh, image, uh, her popularity rates. 
And that's something, of course, that she is struggling with. Yeah? Um, these are the, 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 the state elections that are coming up. Hamburg just voted. And as predicted, uh, uh, the Christian Democratic uh, uh, governor was thrown out and replaced with the opposition party, the Social Democrats. Um, Merkel's main opponent at the national level will now have a, an absolute majority in the state house of Hamburg. Uh, and that's going to you know, be, that's gonna be inter interpreted by many uh, analysts in Germany as a first sign that uh, Angela Merkel has to change course. Uh, it, it, it remains to be seen how the other elections will turn out. The next one, the next important one is in the southern state of Baden-Württemberg, my home state, March 27th, because there you have a Christian democratic, free democratic coalition government just like you have at the national level. And if that coalition loses or comes in weaker, uh, it will signal that uh, the Christian Democrats and the Free Democrats are uh, in, in pretty serious trouble. 2011 will be a steep climb for Angela Merkel and Guido Westerwelle um, with the, you know, the German voter there in, in tow. Uh, some surprises might be uh, waiting at the top of the summit here uh, at the end of 2011. Uh, she got her work cut out for her. Let me talk very briefly about some of the, the conclusions. How does that impact uh, Germany's relationship with uh, uh, the United States? The first thing I want to note here, and I'm sure you probably are aware of this, but uh, many people in Europe, in Germany, feel that the Obama administration has not shown them quite as much love and attention as they would have liked to have. Uh, many uh, observers in, in Europe uh, feel that the focus of the United States has clearly shifted towards Asia, towards China, uh, and uh, of course that hurts their feelings. Uh, and it, 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 uh, it, you know, it signals to the Europeans that they are no longer uh, uh, the center of uh, America's attention uh, uh, when it comes to global affairs. Uh, that's the first thing we have to keep in mind. Uh, Germany is still the dominant economic power in Europe, uh, and they are trying to, yeah, if you will, export their model to uh, other European countries. Whether those other European countries uh, will go along with that will be decided uh, next uh, month at the uh, a, a Euro Summit uh, in, in Brussels, uh, where this uh, uh, economic government, this competitive, competitiveness pact will be adopted or not. It probably will be watered down somewhat. We'll have to see. Uh, Germany uh, plays a, uh, an important role in Afghanistan after the United States and Britain. Germany has the third most troops in Afghanistan, 5,000 soldiers. Uh, doesn't sound very much from an American perspective, but for the Germans it's a significant contribution. Britain has about 6,000, I believe. Uh, so the Germans do play an important role. They also play an important role in the fight against the pirates in the the Red Sea off the coast of Somalia. Germany is contributing to that. Um, what's even more important, at least from a German perspective, is their relations with Russia and how US relations with Russia will impact on German-Russian relations. Uh, you all heard about the, uh, I'm sure, the, the missile pact, which initially, uh, at least in the eyes of the Russians, uh, was pointed against as much against Russia as it was pointed uh, against uh, uh, Iran, the Middle East. Uh, the Germans pushed for uh, a more um, uh, inclusive uh, arrangement with the Russians, and actually they were successful uh, in that uh, the Russians now are part of this missile shield, uh, which, which helps their relations with Europe uh, quite a bit. The main issue, of course, in European, German, and Russian relations is energy security. Uh, Germany and the rest of the European Union uh, receive a lot of their natural resources from Russia, oil, natural gas. They are trying to become more independent from the Middle East. Uh, and uh, in doing so, they are becoming somewhat more dependent on, on Russia. So this is a very important uh, aspect for uh, Europeans in general and Germans in particular. Uh, the issue of Iran is, of course, uh, very much on the, uh, on the agenda still. Uh, Iran's nuclear program, the Germans are concerned about it. 
Uh, they have tried to play a constructive role in the sanctions, but uh, those of you who have been following the news, uh, the German foreign minister, Guido Westerwelle, the leader of the Free Democratic Party, uh, flew to uh, uh, Tehran just a couple of days ago and came back yesterday with two German journalists who had been held since October uh, by the government of Iran because they, they tried to interview um, uh, the family of a woman uh, who had been uh, convicted to, to death by stoning. Uh, those jour journalists were imprisoned, were held. Westerwelle paid a price going there in the middle of uh, the protests in Tehran, sort of uh, 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 shaking hands with the Iranian foreign minister, with President Ahmadinejad of Iran. Uh, and some people in Germany and the rest of the world are saying he should not have done that. Uh, you know, even if the, the reward was the freeing of these two journalists, you do not back up uh, a, a, a violent uh, repressive regime in the middle of protests going on in the streets. Uh, the role of Turkey, especially uh, important for the European Union as a whole. Turkey wants to become a member of the European Union. The United States very much supports that position. The Germans, the French are opposed to it. Why? Turkey is too big, they say, and too poor. If Turkey joins the European Union, it would immediately become the second largest country in the European Union with a significant voting power, with significant influence. Uh, and the Germans uh, are now saying, they have changed their position somewhat on this issue, that Turkey should play a special role in relations to the European Union, but they are not ready for full membership, uh, which is a, a position that is opposed to the US administration position which says Turkey as a moderate Muslim country should be allowed into the European Union to be a, a model for the rest of the, uh, the, the, the primarily the, uh, Islamic countries or Muslim population, countries with a Muslim population. Uh, it would show them a way how to democratize and sort of follow in Turkey's footsteps as a modern Muslim country. That issue is going to remain on the uh, agenda for quite some time. And I want to conclude by just saying what's going on in the Middle East right now in Egypt, in Tunisia. Uh, you might have seen the la last reports on Libya, uh, where Muammar Gaddafi is using fighter planes to bomb uh, peaceful demonstrations. It's an outrage, I must say. Uh, these issues, I think, are, you know, this is Europe's and Germany's, if you will, backyard. Um, their dependence on Middle Eastern oil is just as big still uh, as, as the United States. Uh, so the crisis in the Middle East could uh, clearly uh, bring this you know, soaring German economy down to the ground somewhat. Uh, I'm not, uh, uh, I don't want to say it's going to crash land. I do think that uh, the German economy is doing pretty well and has developed uh, quite a bit of, uh, of steam. Uh, but clearly the crisis in the Middle East, uh, the insecurity of energy resources will have a major impact on, on, on Europe as a whole and Germany in particular. I'll leave it at that uh, and i would be open to any questions, any comments uh, from your side. Thank you very much. Very good question, very important point. Uh, Germany's population, if current trends continue, uh, is set to fall to about 70, 70 million people by the year 2050. So there is a huge uh, demographic uh, decline predicted uh, if current trends continue. What the German government is trying to do right now is um, they are trying to encourage uh, uh, German women, German families to have more babies but that's a, a difficult thing to do. Uh, uh, they are providing some economic incentives for families, um, but I'm, I'm not sure whether that's gonna do, you know, change that trend around. They are also trying to increase or to encourage immigration, especially immigration of uh, high-skilled immigrants. Um, the problem with that, of course, is that as soon as you increase immigration, 
uh, that will lead to a backlash among some people. Uh, it it you, tends to increase xenophobia. Uh, it, it, it tends to uh, increase uh, uh, resentments against uh, an increasing immigrant population. So it's a balancing act. Uh, but I think the German government is, will try to convince uh, the people, the voters in Germany, that Germany cannot maintain its, uh, its leading economic role if its population declines as fast as it is predicted right now. Uh, so immigration, uh, taxing incentives, especially for young families, uh, are uh, intended to at least uh, halt that trend, I don't think, um, they will reverse it. But uh, increased immigration is, is, is a very important uh, aspect of the German government, regardless whether it's a Christian democratic or a social democratic, a left or a right government, uh, they realize that without immigration, Germany is gonna lose uh, its, its, its leading economic role. Do you want me to pick? Or? Um, you, you described uh, Angela, thank you, first, thank you for coming in these tough weather conditions. Thank you. Uh, you described Angela My pleasure. Merkel's uh, policies. They appear to be a bit neoliberal in nature. Yes. Compared to, say, US neoliberal policies or others, just how neoliberal are these? Mm -hmm. And could you give us a sense of the differences in, say, the role of the state and the economy in Germany as opposed to the United States? Okay. Um, Good question, tough questions. Let me say off the top of my head, let me start with your, uh, your last question. What's the role of the, the German government in the economy? Uh, it, is, it is larger than in the United States, this, you know, despite what, what happened during the, the recent crisis. Uh, during normal times, during uh, non-crisis times, the German uh, uh, government takes up about 40, 42% of uh, the total GDP, uh, uh, whereas in the United States it usually hovers around 30, 32 uh, percent. So the German government, uh, uh, German, uh, uh, German government do, does own shares in large companies like Volkswagen, uh, others, uh, and uh, the government share of the total economy is significantly higher than in, in the United States or Japan or even Switzerland. Uh, those uh, countries that have a, a relatively small uh, government uh, sector in their economy. It is smaller than the European average. The European average is somewhere around 47, 48 percent. Uh, when you go to tax revenues, you have the same picture. Um, uh, the, the German government in a European uh, comparative perspective looks fairly small. Compared to the United States, it looks uh, uh, somewhat bigger. Uh, are these policies by Merkel and her predecessor, uh, Chancellor Schroeder, are they, should we call them, neoliberal policies? Yes. I guess in the, in the sense, uh, 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 neoliberal, as Europeans use the term, uh, uh, means uh, uh, a more market-oriented approach. Uh, uh, as I said, uh, a deregulation of, of labor markets, a deregulation of, or a, a weakening of, of labor protection laws, uh, they are part of uh, Angela Merkel's agenda, especially her coalition partner, the Free Democrats, a very business-friendly political party, uh, have pushed for these kind of reforms. But I have to say that even her predecessor, Chancellor Schröder, who was a social democrat, left of center uh, politician uh, from a party that usually has very close ties with the trade unions in Germany, uh, he started some of those very reforms. Uh, he started those reforms like the Agenda 2010, the Hartz reforms, arguing that in order to maintain Germany's competitiveness, uh, these reforms were necessary. And it was somewhat of, uh, you know, only Nixon could go to China kind of uh, syndrome. Uh, it took a social democrat uh, in essence to, to, to start some of these reforms because if Merkel or her predecessor, uh, uh, or you know, another uh, uh, Christian Democrat would have pushed for the very same reforms, uh, there would have been more resistance, uh, probably, uh, because uh, if a social democrat says, we need to reform the labor markets, we need to reform the welfare state, those were the very people who built the welfare state in the first place, so they could be more trusted 
in, in, in instituting moderate reforms, necessary but moderate reforms. Uh, and that's how Schroeder sold it. Not entirely successful, uh, but he and the Social Democratic Party are now claiming that it was their reforms in 2003, 2004, 2005 that actually uh, are now uh, explaining partially at least why the German economy is doing so well. That's the reforms, you know, politics in Germany is fairly centrist. Um, Angela Merkel is no Margaret Thatcher. Uh, she has a strong labor wing in her Christian Democratic Party. There are Catholic trade unions in Germany, uh, and they will see to it that uh, uh, whatever reforms are instituted are not going to cut to the bone of the German welfare state. Uh, um, Actually, many observers would argue that Merkel uh, over the last five years has moved her party more towards the center rather than going uh, uh, you know, to, 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 to a more uh, conservative um, platform. Uh, she has stolen some of the, I shouldn't say stolen, she has borrowed some of the concepts uh, from the Social Democrats. Uh, and and uh, in essence, she, she has continued uh, the Hartz reforms um, perhaps, uh, you know, uh, the role of the Free Democrats is very important. They are pushing for uh, more wide-reaching reforms, uh, but Angela Merkel is, is saying that, uh, um, you know, the, the performance right now of the economy seems to show that moderate, moderate reforms uh, are the, the right mix for Germany. Uh, do, she does not want to abolish, certainly, uh, the, 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 the welfare state. Uh, she wants to tinker at the margins, and they seem to be doing that very successfully. Thank you. Yes, who is next? Oh. Firstly, thank you for coming to talk to us today. And, um, My pleasure. Um, as currently, as you know, for the moment, Germany's economy is you know doing quite well overall. Mm -hmm. I, I do think that that uh, flexible work time arrangement uh, would be something that uh, uh, you know American corporations and unions should look into uh, because it has it has worked very well for for the Germans. This is not done sort of as a national policy, sort of the the, the national government stepping in and 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 requiring companies uh, to do this. This, uh, as I said, it started at, at at Volkswagen at VW in Wolfsburg. Uh, they adopted it for their workforce. They said, you know, the car business is a cyclical business, so during economic boom times, you work more hours uh, without receiving overtime pay. Uh, and then uh, during economic recession, you can sort of use those accumulated hours. We'll give you time off uh, for those accumulated hours, and we won't cut your pay. Uh, we won't pay you more when you work more. We won't pay you less when you pay less. Uh, and, and it works as a stabilizer. Uh, it, it, it does not, you know, uh, reinforce the, 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 boom, the boom times and then the, 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 the recession. And it works for employers because they are able, once the economy picks up, once uh, demand picks up, they don't have to rehire people. They don't have to retrain people, which is costly. Uh, they can simply ratchet up uh, working hours among their core um, uh, um, their core workforce, trained workforce, uh, and during uh, recession times, it, it protects that workforce uh, because they won't be laid off. Uh, they won't go on, uh, on unemployment benefits, which you know helps uh, the government uh, finances, the government uh, coffers, the, the budget. Uh, so it, it's, it's, it seems to be a good deal, and uh, other large corporations are adopting the model in Germany, and I think it, it, it's something that, that could be emulated. Uh, it requires the agreement of employers and unions. Uh, it, it's done, you know, factory or company by company. Uh, the German government encourages it. Uh, uh, another, another policy that uh, the German government has successfully implemented is um, that uh, in those companies that don't have those flexible work time accounts, 
Uh, the German government uh, is paying subsidies to companies uh, if they let their workers uh, work shorter hours without firing them. Uh, the German government will pick up the difference. Uh, the company pays their workers uh, less money, but the German company, uh, government will pick up the difference in wages uh, to make up for the, 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 the shortened work time. Uh, those people stay in employment. Uh, they, they are, you know, uh, 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 they don't go on the dole, they don't become unemployed. Uh, it's a good deal for the German government as well because uh, it would be more costly uh, to pay unemployment than to subsidize employers that forego firing people. Uh, that's another instrument that the government has used very successfully, uh, subsidizing uh, jobs that otherwise would become redundant you know, in, in, not structurally, but sort of cyclic, uh, econ based on economic cycles, uh, keeping people in, em in employment, paying the companies, the employers a subsidy, uh, not to fire them for a short period of time at least uh, until the, the recession is over, uh, pays off uh, for the employers. They don't lose some of their good workers. The government doesn't have to pay out unemployment and of course the workforce uh, doesn't get laid off. That's another instrument that has been very successfully used. It's called Kurzarbeit, short term uh, or short work hours um, also prevented the unemployment rate from, from rising as much as it has, for example, risen here in this country. Those were two that come to mind. Please. Um, well, first of all, I, I'm not sure exactly how I want to phrase this, but um, most of the targeted are though is with the um, role that speculators play in the uh, world economic downturn. Uh -huh. And if you have the expertise, um, you know, looking at how Greece, Ireland, and uh, the U.S. were affected by uh, the derivatives and mortgage bundling and speculator markets. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm not a, a, an economist, I'm not an expert on this, so take what I say with a grain of salt, but I'll try to give you my best estimate of, of what happened, if I understood the question correctly. The Germans uh, came out fairly early on, um, uh, imposing restrictions on the, on the trading of uh, derivatives, on imposing rules on their banks, uh, you know, to, to hold larger reserves, if they engaged into risky behavior. Uh, the, the problem, of course, uh, the Germans can't do this alone. They have to push for a European solution because it is nowadays fairly easy to cross borders for capital, uh, for investors. If they think the conditions you know, uh, 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 in one country are uh, detrimental to their profits, it's fairly easy for them to go across the border. So everything that has to be done has to be done on a, in a coordinated fashion. Sometimes the Germans, as they did in this case, uh, could sort of jump ahead somewhat and hope that the other European countries would follow uh, because Germany has such a, a large economic weight. Uh, because Germany is, such, is the largest economy in Europe, sometimes they have a, uh, you know, a pioneering role uh, but 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 even even uh, in this case, when it cam comes to new banking regulations, the Germans have been pushing for a Europe-wide solution. I uh, don't know whether that answers your question. Uh, on on the speculators, um, maybe I, I'd say this: um, the, the the charge was that uh, investors, especially in the United States, hedge funds, George Soros, you know. We are betting against the euro, uh, and they were they were betting against uh, Greece and and other countries, Ireland, Portugal, primarily Greece at the time. Uh, the the Greek government needs to refinance its debt on a on a recurrent basis. They need to sell bonds, uh, and uh, if if international investors are not willing to buy Greek bonds because they can't be quite sure whether they'll get their money back eventually. That drives up the price of Greek bonds. Uh, if the German government says, you know, we are not going to support 
the Greek government, uh, uh, we're not going to, if the German central bank says we are not going to buy Greek bonds from the Greek central bank, uh, uh, that drives up the price, that makes it more difficult for the Greek government to finance its, its debt and its deficit on a recurrent basis. Uh, and the Germans were dragging their feet, they were saying before we commit more money, before we bail out a country like Greece, we want to see some real reform. We want to see the Greek government uh, doing this or that, which the Greeks didn't take too kindly. There were a couple of suggestions on uh, German, uh, you know, the yellow press, I think you would call it, uh, 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 published a, a headline saying the Greeks should sell their islands, their beautiful islands, presumably to German uh, <laughs> investors. Uh, the Greeks should uh, sell some of their uh, their arts and culture, cultural artifacts, you know, to raise the money that they need to bail themselves out. Uh, that didn't go across very well. Uh, that was not a, a fair suggestion. I hope that answers your question. Yep. Yep. Very well. Mm -hmm. any kind of health care reform or socialism, and yet what you're presenting here is a model where Germany has much more um, public involvement in the economy, a bigger social welfare state and so forth, and is doing well economically. So I wonder if you can help us understand that a little more. All right. That's a, a tough question, too, but uh, I'll, I'll give it my best shot. I mean, the first thing I would say is that uh, these, these types of economic models, the, you know, the, the German model, the American model. Uh, Nicolas Sarkozy, the president of France, came in uh, in 2007 and said, we, the Europeans, we should adopt more of the American model. That would be good for Europe. Uh, he probably wouldn't be necessarily saying this right now, uh, at least when it comes to certain aspects. But be that as it may, uh, the, the, the German model, or the French call it the, the Rhenish model, uh, uh, the, the European model of a, a larger welfare state uh, and more government regulation of the economy has grown over the decades. Uh, and it's, it's sort of, it's reinforced in different spheres of not just the economy, but society as a whole. Uh, it's not easy, it wouldn't be easy to adopt uh, the German or the European model to any other country in the world. And it, it might not work you know, in a country like the United States because it, it, it comes with a certain, uh, how shall I put this, uh, a, a certain uh, public, uh, you know, public opinion about what is the proper role of the state in the economy, what is the proper role of the government when it comes to providing social benefits. And the political philosophy in Europe, in Germany, and in, the, in France, let's say, has always been a strong state, you know, is a good thing, uh, especially during crisis. Uh, uh, whereas, of course, here in the United States, that has not necessarily been the case. Um, so that just as, a, as, a, uh, as, as an introductory remark. Um, I think what, what the recent crisis showed that uh, of course, a, a, a larger welfare state is costly. Germans pay significantly more taxes than Americans do. Surprise, surprise. Uh, but they do get benefits, uh, and therefore they are more willing to pay those higher taxes because it, during times of crisis, uh, the German government, you know, uh, through, through certain programs, uh, through more generous benefits, acts in a sense, I call it you know, an automatic st stabilizer of the economy. When President Obama was pushing the Europeans, and especially the Germans, in the middle of the crisis, uh, saying you need to do more uh, in terms of stimulus for your economy, uh, uh, Angela Merkel said, no, we don't, because we have all these built-in stimulus packages. Yeah? Instead of uh, our employers laying off people, we pay them money to not lay off people, because that helps us you know, with our unemployment payments that helps us with our tax revenues. It's an automatic stabilizer. 
Now we don't need to stim stimulate the economy through a stimulus package, additional money. Uh, we have built that into our regulatory framework. Uh, it kicks in automatically uh, in times of recession. Uh, and that's something that has grown you know, uh, over the years uh, since the last uh, severe economic crisis. It, it, some of this was introduced to help the East German economy after unification. Uh, Kurzarbeit, uh, the short-term work subsidies were introduced back then. So the unemployment rate in, in East Germany when their economy collapsed right after uh, reunification would not you know, uh, uh, shoot up to 20, 30 percent. So some of these elements of the German political economy, I would call it, uh, you know, have been around for some time and Germans accept them and they are willing to pay higher taxes because they derive certain benefits from it. Uh, it gives everybody a little bit more job security. It, 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 it does guarantee uh, um, a, a better standard of living if you do get uh, uh, laid off. Um, teachers in Germany are better paid than teachers in the United States. Uh, should say that too. Um, their role is, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, acknowledged in society throughout an important role for uh, a competitive economy to maintain competitiveness. You need uh, good teachers, you need good schools. The same arguments that, of course, we hear here in the United States. Um, in general, wages in Germany are probably on the average, uh, median wage, average wage is probably slightly higher than here in the United States, the median wage, I would think. But as I said, uh, you're also, you're taxed more, your social uh, security contributions are more substantive, but Germans have learned to accept these things because they say, we do get you know, a bank for our buck. The, the German government plays a stabilizing role during term, times of economic crisis. That's the best short answer. I, I could teach a seminar, well, maybe not, but uh, I could try to teach a seminar about this. It's, it's a very interesting question. You know, how models, different models of political economy, how they have grown over time, and how they change people's perceptions. What is fair? What share should everybody you know, contribute to the well-being of society as a whole? There's a whole different political philosophy uh, here that has grown over decades. And it wouldn't be easy to transfer one model to the other side because you couldn't transfer the mindset at the same time. Uh -huh. It becomes a huge infusion of uh, technology and capital. Mm -hmm. And in this regard, European countries have, have been more liberal than the United States because uh, they are more retained here in the United States. And I see that President Obama is trying to correct that. Mm -hmm. uh, Thank you. Uh, if, I, if I understood your question correctly, I mean, uh, you, you are looking for... Uh, uh, the reasons why the Europeans, the Germans in particular, have been more successful in terms of exports to China. I, I hope I, I pointed out some of the reasons. Um, you know, the Germans used to produce uh, what, what the Chinese wanted to buy, especially, you know, the, the new middle class in, in China. Apparently, they like, well, they like Buicks, but they also like uh, German, you know, uh, Volkswagens and uh, mercedes Benzes. So there is a huge new market that German high quality product sort of producers can tap into. Uh, but as I said, uh, you know, the, the Germans, uh, they no longer necessarily produce the cars that they sell directly to China. They now produce the machinery that Chinese car manufacturers need to produce Chinese cars. Well, yeah? That's what I meant. I mean, mm -hmm. countries are more willing to export technology and capital. All right. Um, Yes, all right, let me try to answer that question. You're absolutely right. You said, you know, the United States is more sensitive about certain technologies being exported to China. The Europeans are sensitive about copyright uh, uh, laws. They are sensitive about, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, the transfer of knowledge, things like that. Uh, uh, as well, I think in the United States, what plays perhaps a more important role when it comes to the relations 
with China is that uh, the, in the United States, many people see China as a rival, as a competitor, uh, as a, an, an aspirant to become the, the superpower of the 21st century. Uh, and that's sort of seen as a zero-sum game. More power for China means less power for the United States. All the European countries, and certainly Germany, they don't have great power aspirations or world power, superpower aspirations. They don't see China as, 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 a, as a political rival, certainly, uh, and they don't really see it, I think, as an economic rival. They see it more as a challenge and uh, uh, you know, a potential market. So they are not as sensitive about technology transfer because they are not transferring technology they are, they are not sort of uh, uh, enabling, in their eyes, China to you know, outdo them as a, as a superpower. That plays a role here. Europeans, in general, you know, they, they realize China is, uh, uh, is, is growing, is expanding, is becoming politically and militarily more important, but they see it as an economic opportunity, and they don't have the same kind of concerns about China you know, becoming a, 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 a new... Uh, dominant power. Uh, many people in, 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 in Europe for a time thought if Europe came together, if the European Union uh, would be uh, more united, it could maybe rival the United States, it could maybe rival China as a future you know, world power, but given how European integration has gone more recently, I think a lot of people have kind of given up on that, on that uh, uh, dream. Uh, most Europeans now look at European integration as a way to remain relevant, uh, not to rival the United States, not to rival China. Uh, they don't believe that Europe ever, many Europeans do, could be a United States of Europe that you know, is, is, is you know, at, at, at uh, uh, how do you put that in English, is at face-to-face uh, uh, -face with the United States. They have accepted the fact that Europe is an economic giant, but it will remain a political and probably military, uh, don't want to say dwarf, but uh, a, a, a lesser power. Yeah? Uh, and that's, they accept that with the United States. They have for the last you know, 50 years during the Cold War, the United States was the superpower, the protector. If China assumes a superpower status, then the Europeans, the Germans will try to arrange themselves. Uh, they don't see China as much as a rival or a threat as perhaps some people here in the United States do. That would be my reading of the different economic relations between the Europeans and uh, the Chinese. Thank you. That was a long answer. for your presentation, still not? It's, it's, I think it's, yeah, there we go. it can't come. Thank you very much for your presentation and for helping us uh, put Germany into perspective within the European Union and in the world. We appreciate it very much, particularly on such short notice. You're welcome. Thank you for coming and get home safely. <laughs>